So, let me just, uh, I, point, I had pointed out in the last lecture that there was a little error in the computing this number. So, I have just done the last two tableaus uh, again. This is the inverse tableau uh, presentation of the LPP algorithm for the parametric cost problem. So, the problem we were discussing in the last lecture, so that one continues here. So, um, the correction was somewhere here. So, just make sure you know with the uh, tables in the last lecture, you compare and see the make the corrections wherever necessary. So, I think we had almost completed the problem. So, here in this case, you see uh, the um, uh, for the positive ones, the ratios are 6, 6 and uh, oh, okay. uh, the 8 number is missing somewhere. So, this part we had done already and it was for x 6. So, this should be, uh -huh, okay. uh, this number should have been 8, no, no, not this one. Achha, this I am showing you, okay. this tableau shows you when x 6 has been brought into the basis. So, this number was 48 and minus 6. Okay. So, when you take the ratio, it will be a minus 48 by 6, which would be 8. So, this tableau shows you the computation for the uh, after x 6 has been brought into the basis. So, you have the, uh, I mean, okay. so this uh, you, you are pivoting on 2. Uh, okay. So, this is for your um, uh, basic column. So, anyway, uh, for x 6, uh, the ratio, the upper ratio would be 8 and the lower ratios are 6 for the mu and you are pivoting on this. So, after this, when you do the pivoting on 2, so you will be dividing by 2 and yeah. So, this tableau shows you after you have pivoted on this element. Okay. So, here in this case, um, the interval was 6 and 8. So, the characteristic interval for the corresponding basis x 5, x 4 and x 3, x 5, x 4 and x 3, uh, when this these are the basic variables, the um, corresponding characteristic interval for mu is 6 comma 8. Right? So, after and then um, x 6 has to come into the basis, this is the pivoting element, you do the pivoting, you come back here and uh, let us see what are the ratios. Yeah, I have computed them for you, 66 minus 66 upon 8, so that becomes 66 upon 8, which is equal to 8.25. Okay. And for the negative ones, uh, for the positive ones, the ratios are th 30 by 4 which will be 7.5 and 24 by 3, which is 8. So, you see this is your lower, because you take the max of this and there is only one entry here. So, uh, that is the only one, otherwise you would have more than one, you would have taken the minimum of the two, whatever the entries here. So, therefore, the next characteristic interval is for you 8 and 8.25, as you would expect. Right? This lower and this upper should match. Okay. Now, up after 8.25, you see um, we can now make use of this fact that you started with your basis, your starting basis was x 1, x 2, x 3. This was your starting basis. This was your starting basis. So, therefore, um, what figures here is your, this corresponds to x 1 now. Okay this whole column corresponds to x 1, because you started with your um, um, column for x 1 here and after all the iterations. So, actually this shows you uh, the column for x 1, this shows you the column for x 2 and this shows you the column for x 3. Okay. And so, from here you can see that for lambda for mu greater than 8.25, this will be a candidate for coming into the basis. Your um, column A 1 will be a candidate for coming into the basis, but corresponding entries here are all less than 0. So, therefore, uh, this uh, mu greater than 8.25 x 1 is to become a basic variable, yeah, but y 1 is all less than or equal to 0. In fact, it is all less than 0. So, this implies problem is unbounded unbounded for la, a mu mu greater than or equal to 8.25 uh, greater than, because it has to be an open interval. Right. 
for 8.25 we already have a basis which is optimal which is your x 5, x 4 and x 6 are the basic variables right. And um, okay, the uh, starting tableau is not there, but you could have uh, you, you could have checked that we started with I think uh, we started with the uh, six up to yeah. So uh, so far the characteristic intervals that you have obtained are this eight point two five um, eight and eight point two five, and then you have the open interval. 8.25 to infinity, right? And for mu less than six, if you uh, in the in the original tableau, in the original tableau, your a4 was less than zero, less than or equal to zero, whatever it is. Oh, so that would imp so this would imply uh, original tableau a4 and c4 minus z4 also less than zero. So this implies the problem is infeasible or oh sorry unbounded again the problem is unbounded again for mu less than 6 okay is unbounded for mu less than 6 right so therefore you have the complete partition for the the partition of the air uh, partition of the real line is as follows. As follows, so this is minus infinity to 6 open interval, then 6 to 8 is a closed interval, 8 to 8 to 8.25 is again a characteristic interval. Uh, which is closed and then you have the open interval 8.25 to infinity. See while uh, showing you the breakup for the real line, we had computed all the intervals, but uh, while writing out the final breakup for the real line, I should have written minus infinity 6 and then we had also computed this, which I did not mention in the lecture. So, this was a singleton, right? And then, of course, we recorded all the other uh, intervals, which is 8, 8.25, 8 uh, and um, finally, um, 8.25 infinity. So, the real breakup that means you when you, uh, you add up all these intervals, you would get the uh, break up for the real line from minus infinity to infinity. So, the, uh, the singleton, the interval containing the single element 6 got left out. So, kindly read this as the real break up of the uh, real line. As occasion arises, we will also see that we may need such situations um, after we have solved a particular problem. So, this can, um, we will be coming back to it sometime again. Okay. So, now uh, I want to start a new topic and that is you know min cost uh, well okay the min is for short for minimize min cost uh, min cost flow problem and you'll be surprised how vast uh, the uh, area is where the problems arise uh, which can be formulated, modeled as min cost flow problems. And then we will look at the special cases. I already looked at one of them. For example, when I formulate the general uh, uh, min cost flow problem, the shortest path problem that we discussed is also a special case. And I will show you later on how it is. But let me first, uh, okay, so uh, just a few terminologies and then we can start defining and formulating the min cost flow problem. So, the idea is you have G is V and A. So, here again uh, for the shortest path problem, I also I took the directed arcs, the directed edges, we, which we call as arcs. So, um, G is V A, where V is the node set. So, I will just redefine and A is the arc set, that is A is the pair, ordered pair, you can say I J ordered pairs 
pairs for i and j belonging to V. So, that means, you, you have a node i and you have a node j, the idea is you have a directed arc. That means, you can go from i to j, this is the idea. And so, this is the ordered pair i comma j. So, we also have concept of undirected edges, which are called edges. So, edges where simply i and j, that means, you can go from i to j or j to i, no direction is specified. Okay. And you can, you can have a situation where you have some edges are directed and some edges are not directed. So, it will be called a mixed graph. So, anyway, usually when you have the uh, direction set between all pairs of nodes, then you say that uh, a g is a directed, directed graph, right. g is a directed graph when uh, the edges are all directed. So, edges imply no direction when the edges are directed, are all when all, all the edges are directed, edges are directed. Okay. You can read it as directed, g is a directed and another word for a directed graph is, another word is network. So, it is a network. So, ne network implies that the, there is direction uh, from a node to another node. That means, you have you are, you are considering only, because uh, networks are basically considered in the uh, in the connection, in connection of uh, flows. And so, uh, you always have uh, directed edges uh, in a network. So, I uh, will be using directed graphs and networks synonymously, right. Sometimes, I may refer to it as this and so on. So, some more, um, uh, so let me first define the thing and um, let me define the problem. So, uh, uh, min cost problem, min, uh, min cost flow problem can be formulated as okay. And I'll define the terms as we go along. So minimize uh, z equal to summation c i j x i j, where i j is your edge in the directed graph, subject to summation x i j summation over j minus summation x k i summation over k is equal to b i. I will define all these terms. And then we have uh, an uh, capacity constraint also. So, let me write this as less than or equal to u i j. Right. And here, let me say that this is for each node. So, i belonging to v. That means, for each node. So, um, yes. So, let me specify the thing. So, b i can be a positive or a negative number, right? And uh, B i greater than zero indicates uh, the amount of a certain of a commodity of a of an item available. Okay, it could be it could be the capacity. You see, you may have um, um, telephone exchanges, and B I may denote the capacity of the phone calls that at a particular time the exchange can uh, handle. Right? As I said, uh, in, in this course, probably one cannot just uh, give you all possible situations where these problems can occur or where the problems can be formulated as mean cost flow problem. But hopefully, you will you'll get a good idea by the time we finish with the uh, various special cases and so on of this class of problems. And of course, I will tell you why we are discussing it in the uh, linear programming formulation, linear programming course, because as it is, you see, first of all, that the formulation is a linear programming problem, right. And then there will be many good other reasons for uh, doing it here. Okay. So, let us see, B i positive indicates the amount of amount amount of an item available at node i. 
okay. right. and B i less than 0 would indicate the demand, demand for the item. at node i. Okay. So, obviously, what the uh, concept is that uh, positive quantity is available for supply and a negative number indicates that uh, things are being demanded or required at that particular node. Right. Then, um, we refer to, so you as you can guess that your x i j is the decision variable. Right, decision variable, and uh, it uh, tells you um, decision variable regarding the amount to be sent along arc ij. Okay, so you are using the arc ij. If you are using the arc ij, then xij tells you. That means xij positive value will tell you. Uh, the amount that has to be sent on the arc i j. Right. Then, u uh, i j uh, is a positive number, u uh, i j is positive and denotes the capacity of the uh, of capacity of arc i j. Yes, and you can immediately uh, related to say for example, if you are sending th things by trucks, then the capacity of the truck that uh, they can uh, there is a certain amount beyond which you cannot send uh, the items through uh, that uh, through the truck or the railroad uh, you know you hire a carriage that capacity or um, telephone exchange as I told you for a particular arc again uh, the telephone lines are built for certain uh, capacity. Yeah, they cannot handle unlimited amount of uh, volume of traffic. So, uh, uh, railroads and so on, uh, all these situations you can figure out. So, u i j, so it is a very natural uh, constraint on the system, on the variable, right. Fine. Then, um, c i j of course, is the cost. So, c i j is the cost of sending a unit, sending a unit of item on uh, along arc i j. Okay. Finally, this gives you, these are your flow conservation constraints, which uh, for remember uh, for the shortest path problem, we wanted that, uh, uh, see the b i s were only 1 and minus 1 for the, uh, uh, b i was 1 for the, for the node from which you wanted to begin your shortest path it was minus 1 for the node, which was to, uh, for to wish the shortest path to be found. And then all other nodes were intermediate nodes, in the sense that they were only being used for uh, the constructing the shortest path from the starting node to the ending node. So, they were all zeros. So, um, uh, we have already uh, sort of had a, uh, uh, we, have, we have already looked at the uh, flow conservation concept. And so, here all it is saying is that, uh, from a particular node i, if b i is positive, then b i is the amount available at that node. So, certainly you do not want to be sending more than the item available at a node. And similarly, at a demand node, you would want the required amount to be sent to that point. Right? While formulating this uh, min cost max flow problem, I had in the beginning not mentioned that sigma b i should be equal to 0. Later on, I did say that of course, this is the necessary condition that uh, the all the b i s must add up to 0. So, now I am just inserting it in the uh, time uh, beginning of the uh, formulation of the problem. And uh, as I told you that uh, when uh, no, uh, arc leaving arc, so this was yes, uh, if an arc leaves a node, it has a positive sign, if an arc enters a node, it has a negative sign. So, it is possible that node i may be receiving some amount and then it is sending some amount but the net amount. So, whatever it receives, that is the amount beyond, say if this b i is positive. right? What we are saying is that you may have some amount coming to node i. So, that means, the amount will become more than b i. 
but then you will be sending amount to other nodes. So, finally, the conservation equation, the flow conservation equation says that the net amount that node i handles should not be more than b i, whether b i is positive or negative. right? Even if b i is negative, then that means it will be receiving amounts and it will be sending out, but the net amount. So, this is this tells you the total amount which is being sent from node i and this tells you the amount which is coming from nodes like k to node i right? and that is a minus thing. So, then uh, the net amount that node i handles should be equal to b i, whether b i is positive or negative. right? So, these are the flow conservation equations. So, which we always maintain and therefore, we maintain a feasible solution. Okay. Um, yes. So, now uh, we need to need know have a few more definitions. Say for example, I did define a path for you, but let us do it again uh, in this course. So, uh, first let us say that uh, yes. So, let us define a path. A path from let's say from node i to node j and this is a sequence of so this is a sequence of arcs uh, let's say i k1 k1 k2 so, you see consecutive arcs or we can say adjacent arcs i to k 1 then k 1 to k 2, because uh, that is the concept of a path. right? And similarly, from here it will be k l to j. So, finally, k l to j. Right? Some people like to define uh, arcs and nodes, but I want to keep it simple. So, you understand that from i to k 1 then k 1 to k 2. So, uh, the node part is quite clear. Okay? fine sequence of arcs. Then we say that the um, path is simple if no node is repeated. Okay. So, path is simple and th that has uh, that is important for us, because sometimes so uh, that means you are not coming back to a node and then going out. So let me let me give you an example. So let us just consider a directed graph. Okay. So you have a directed graph here. So, for example, a simple path would be something like uh, 1, 3, 3, 2. Um, yes, I should have said something more. Now that I am giving the example, I realize that, um, well, uh, I have said it things like so 1, 3, 3, 2, um, then you can have uh, 3, 4. Okay, and uh, then 4, 6. So, simple path from 1 to 6. Yeah, I should have said here sequence of arcs where, uh, let me add here where either uh, k i k i plus 1 or k i plus 1 k i is belongs to A. Little crowded, but I think you can read it. So, what I am saying is that it is not necessary when I am giving you a sequence of arcs, it is not necessary that each of the arcs is in A, it can be either way. So, so the concept of path is a little general here, because what we are saying here is, uh, whereas for the shortest path, when we were looking at a path, it was directed path. Okay because we wanted to actually go from 1 to 6 and so for example it was 1 2 2 4 4 6 so, so we were trying to find out paths which had the same direction all arcs had the same direction but here uh, uh, path is a little more general and we can take it to be um, so for example 1 3 uh, then i am taking 
3 2, 3 4, uh, uh, okay, that would not be correct. So, this would not be correct, 2 3, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this would not be 1 3, 2 3, 3 4. I would have to make it 2 3, right. So, writing an example helps, yeah. So, it will be 1 3 2 3, then 3 4, that is also not correct. So, let me take it to be 1 2. Okay. So, a simple path would be 1 2 2 3, then 3 4 I can take and 4 to 6. Okay. So, this is a simple path from 1 to 6, but if you, uh, so not simple path, uh, but uh, if you take the path, the path, uh, the path, um, let me say uh, 1 3, and uh, then 3, 4, 4, 2 and then if I add 2, 3. So, you see 1, 3, 3, 4, 4, 2, 2, 3. So, now the node is being repeated, node 3 is repeated and then I can go from 3 to 5 and 5 to 6. So, the path is not simple, is not Okay. It's, this, is, this is not a simple path, because you are repeating a node, you are visiting a node again, whereas here I am not visiting a node again, 1, 2, 2, 3, then 3, 4 and 4, 6. Okay. So, no node is being repeated, so that is very important, simple paths. Okay. So, path is simple. Now, in if, if okay. now I want to define a cycle or some people call it a circuit. So, cycle is a, is a simple path in which the first node, first and the last nodes are the same. Okay. So, a cycle or a circuit is a simple path. So, for example, here, um, let me give you an example here. Yeah, it is very simple 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. Hmm. 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. This is a cycle, right. So, there are so many of them 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, 5, 5, 3, 3, 1, any of them. So, the last node and the first node are the same then it is uh, in a simple path, it becomes a cycle. Okay. Then we also are interested in other configuration and there are many more other things, which we will not need right away. So, if we need them again, whenever we need them, I will try to define, but right now, uh, I just want to begin with the basic uh, definition, so that we can start with the algorithm. Uh, this is a tree. Okay. So, now you have a cycle and you want to look at, okay, uh, you can also have a definition called sub net sub network, sub network or a sub graph. So, a sub graph which will mean that it is a sub graph. So, you want to call it G prime, this will be V and A prime. That means, it's a, it has the same node set as G but the arc set may be a subset of this, where, where A prime is a subset of A. This is important. So, it becomes a sub network. Then you also may be sometimes, uh, right. So, this is good enough for us. Fine, sub network or a sub graph. So, now we want to say that um, tree or a spanning tree, spanning tree is a sub graph. So, everything all is being, uh, everything is being defined with respect to the original graph G, which is V A. Huh? So, spanning tree, a spanning tree is a sub graph with no cycles. Okay. with no cycles. 
So, for example, here remember a subgraph has to have the same node set. So, we are wanting a subgraph, but with no cycles. So, that means here if you remove the uh, edges which are or arcs which are making uh, cycles, then uh, so for example, I would remove this. This can be and of course, this is not unique, there can be so many spanning graphs. So, um, let me uh, if I remove this, then what happens? You have a cycle, yes, you have a cycle. So, if you remove this, Okay, is a subgraph with no cycles? No, one more thing I should have defined. There is still a cycle here. So, this is not okay, right, because this would have been a cycle, but uh, 2, 4, and 5. Yes, this would be a spanning tree, but then another concept which I should have defined, and that is connectedness. So, let me uh, talk about connectedness. I will keep that as it is right now connectedness. So, right after a path, I should have defined this thing after a path, right. A graph is connected if there is a path. And remember, when I say a path, I mean a simple path. If there is a path between every pair of nodes, every pair of nodes of G. So, connectedness, that means I should be able to connect two nodes, any two nodes of the graph via a path. Okay. So, what I drew for you was a connected uh, graph, but for example, if I have something like this, Right, and I have a singleton here. You may have this, you may have this, does not matter, but still this graph is not connected, because I cannot in any uh, way reach from 1 to 5 or 2 to or from any or from any node here to 5. Right? So, this is not a connected graph. So, we want connectedness. So, therefore, uh, what I have to say here is the definition is not complete. The definition has to be is a connected subgraph with no cycles is a, so that is very important here one has to add is a connected connected, this is very important. So, a connected subgraph with no cycles is a spanning tree, okay. because I could have had see here we had uh, this edge does not matter which direction it is. Suppose, you consider this. Okay. Then, if I had not written the word connected, I could have had something like this. I could have had a subgraph. So, there, no, there to be no cycles. So, I will have this. Then, I could have 4, 6 and 5. Yeah, no cycles. So, this is a subgraph, because all the nodes are there, the 6 nodes are there uh, and no cycles are present. So, that definition was not complete. I have to say that it is a connected subgraph with no cycles. So, what I drew for you here finally is a, so this, this was a tree. Right. So, here you can image see how many edges arcs 2, 4 and 5, 6 edges. So, this is the important result which uh, uh, we will not prove because one can one requires a little bit of uh, more rigor. So we will simply take it as it is, and we will use this thoroughly. Uh, it is so. What the claim claim is? If cardinality of V is n, then any spanning of G will have exactly n minus 1 arcs. By the way, what I am defining is all also valid for an undirected graph, right. 
So, um, this is a spanning tree will have exactly n minus 1 arcs, if the, uh, if the cardinality of the uh, node set is n. Okay. And uh, using this then, we can uh, do a lot of interesting things. And so, now uh, let me just put in a few words, why we are, see um, of course, as I told you, many, many situations can be modeled as min cost flow problems. That is one important uh, reason why we look at them. And secondly, why I am looking at uh, these problems in the linear programming course is that I want to demonstrate that if your problems have special structures, then simplex algorithm exploits them beautifully. And we will see how it um, simplifies the algorithm, because, because uh, the problem have special structure and why do I say problems have special structures? Because you see, um, the constraints are this kind and while discussing the shortest path problem, I showed you that when you write the node arc incidence matrix, which will be the coefficient matrix here, when you have on, on this side you have nodes and you have arcs, arcs here, then every um, column will have only two non-zero entries and they will be 1 and minus 1. So, this I had shown you uh, in the, when uh, while we were discussing the shortest path problem and I talked about the node arc incidence matrix. So, this special structure really simplifies the simplex algorithm and in fact, you can, the way I will solve problems for you, I will actually, uh, without bothering to show you, uh, give you the tableau and I do not need to, I will actually uh, show the uh, progress of the simplex algorithm on the graph itself and you can see how things are happening. So, therefore, um, uh, another aspect of and that is why we said that uh, linear programming is uh, the uh, simplex algorithm is so versatile that you do not need uh, to uh, keep on adding <laughs> about uh, talking about its properties. And as the thing as the course is unfolding, you see that um, uh, you can really do many, many things with the uh, with the um, uh, simplex algorithm. And so, uh, we will start we will define uh, the concept of base and what, what a basic solution, basic feasible solution here would mean and so on. So, I will uh, continue defining. Yeah, by the way, I should have said also that here very important condition is that sigma b i is 0. This is very important. That is, it is a balanced because when I am saying flow conservation and I am saying that whatever is available should be uh, also, uh, we, since we have equality constraint is very important and we will show you why, because if you sum up uh, this thing with respect to i, then you see that this sum and this sum will be exactly the same and so, uh, sigma b i must be 0. So, this is a necessary condition for feasibility of this problem. So, therefore, uh, feasibility will also not be a concern here. We will discuss assignment 5 now with you, which is based on the um, portion of sensitivity analysis and parametric uh, programming that we discussed in the last few lectures. So, uh, the first problem is a product mix problem. That means, uh, you are given some raw materials and the uh, manufacturer has to uh, manufacture certain products and he has to maximize his profit. So, because uh, we want to formulate the problem as a minimizing problem. So, I have taken minus of the objective function and so, it is a minimization problem with the minus co cost coefficients and then the raw materials available are there are three different raw materials and the availability is given to you of these raw materials. Okay. And now, uh, x 5, x 6 and x 7 are the slack variables and uh, corresponding to the three inequalities. Then, uh, b is an optimal basis and I have given you the corresponding. Uh, so, I have told you that uh, the uh, variables x 1, x 3 and x 2 are the basic variables. Okay. That means, your basis will consist of columns a 1, a 3 and a 2 and then I have show, given you the b inverse. Uh, the call, right? Now, uh, you have to answer these following questions, uh, which, which are concerned with post optimality analysis and I would like you to support your answers with uh, good proper reasons. Right? So, if, for example, in the first part, in the in part a, I am asking you to, uh, if you are if you know that, um, you know, you can increase the availability of one of the raw materials, then which one will you choose? And you know that uh, the person is trying to maximize his profit, the manufacturer and uh, the, uh, the dual variables 
give you the prices of the raw materials. So, therefore, you can now figure out how to answer this question. Okay. So, the, what I am asking you is, you have a choice of increasing the availability of only one of the materials in one by one unit, which one will you choose? So, the rate of increase of uh, the objective function value is given by the dual variables. Okay. Part B says, what is an optimum feasible solution? What is an optimum solution if availability of B 2 is increased by 31 units? Okay. Optimal solution implies feasibility. If available of B 2 is increased, so right hand side the value of B 2 has increased by 31 units, I want you to find out uh, the optimal solution. Either the current solution is optimal and if not, then you have to apply dual simplex algorithm. Okay. Uh, part C asks you to um, find out if total of 10 units of third raw material can be made available that is 4 units more, already 6 are available. So, 4 more are available. What is the maximum amount you can afford to pay for it? So, kindly think about it again, the answer will come through the dual variables. So, the, what is the maximum amount you can afford to pay for it? Part D uh, says that obtain the interval for C 1, such that the current solution remains optimal for all values of C 1 in that interval and do the same for C 2. Okay. C 1 and C 2 both turn out to be optimal intervals. Okay. Maybe you can also on your own do it for some non-basic uh, uh, variables also, the price ranging. Fine. Part E says that if um, x b denotes the number, oh, sorry, x 8 denotes the number of new product that the company has the option to produce at rupees uh, 10 per unit. Oh no, it should have been minus rupee, because um, again um, see, because the objective function I am writing as minimization. So, therefore, uh, it, this should be actually minus 10 per unit. In the objective function, the cost coefficient will be uh, right. Okay. So, I have taken care of that in the problem. So, uh, the actual cost is 10, but the, he is minimize, the profit is 10 rupees per unit, but uh, in the objective function, it will appear as minus 10 x 8, since we are minimizing the objective function. All right. So, then let uh, A 8 transpose, I am giving you the column, this is parameterized, it has a parameter lambda appearing in it. So, that means, here we are considering uh, changes in the um, technology uh, coefficients and uh, what input output coefficients you can call, at what value of lambda will it become profitable to manufacture the new product. So, this remember uh, when you add a new product, that means you are adding a new column, you add a new, new constraint to the dual problem. So, again you can uh, try to answer uh, what the value of lambda would be for which uh, or what it can be more than one value of lambda for which the current solution will remain optimal. That means, you have to actually check for dual optimal, dual feasibility. Uh, in F, you have to fi find, find out the range of values of theta uh, for which the current solution will remain optimal, if the input output coefficient A 2 2 is changed to A 2 2 plus theta. Again, here I am trying to, uh, A 2 2 corresponds to uh, col basic column and therefore, you will have to do a little bit of work to find out the range of uh, range for theta so that the current solution remains optimal. Problem 2. Now, here uh, you have a parametric right hand side problem and this I have already discussed in my lecture, but I would like you to sit down and write it down properly. So, you have to say that you have to answer uh, the question that if uh, the problem is infeasible for a particular value of lambda, which is lambda naught, then you have to show that the problem will either be infeasible for all lambda less than or equal to lambda naught or for all values of lambda greater than or equal to lambda naught. I have been emphasizing for you that either infeasibility or unboundedness will always be valid for an open interval and so I want you to prove it here. Question 3, I have designed specifically, I mean I took some time to uh, come out with the right numbers. Of course, uh, the calculations may still prove to be a little uh, cumbersome, but anyway, in the third problem, I have given you, um, uh, it is a parametric right, uh, cost problem. Okay. So, the C uh, row is the top one, C star is the uh, row below it and it is a, a two constraint problem. So, objection function, objective function is to be minimized. Solve the problem for all values of the parameter mu, starting with the basic feasible solution consisting of the basic variables x 1, x 5. That means, your starting basis will consist of the columns a 1 and a 5. 
So, I wanted to actually um, design a problem in which uh, and give you a uh, basis for which uh, there is no, which is not optimal for any value of mu. It was the idea, right. And so, finally, I could do it. And so, in this you will see that when you uh, come out with the basis and when you compute the uh, lower uh, value for mu and upper value for mu, the, the lower value will be higher than the upper value. And so, the interval, uh, the characteristic interval is empty corresponding to this basis. Okay. And so, now you have to uh, proceed from here and um, yes, the what, what will be the idea here? That uh, say uh, the lower level, lower interval is uh, bigger than the upper interval. So, where will you begin? You will begin with the upper interval, because the corresponding when, when the value is less than the upper interval value, say mu upper bar. So, when mu value of mu is less than mu upper bar, your uh, corresponding uh, variable, uh, this uh, the relative cost will become negative. And so, you can proceed with the values of mu less than mu upper bar. From there, you will begin and then you will be able to, because uh, see it will not help you to choose the uh, lower thing. Since, the lower uh, uh, mu lower bar is higher than the mu upper bar. So, you should proceed with the mu upper bar. And so, take start with mu less than mu upper bar and you should be able to continue and then get a full partition for the real line. Okay. So, um, of course, this is not the end of uh, problems that you can uh, work out on uh, sensitivity analysis and parametric analysis. These, these are only representative problems. And I hope that uh, you will try out many more on your own from many other textbooks. And I have already the reference books I have already uh, mentioned to you right in the beginning. And um, all these books have lot of problems for you to work out and get a good feeling for uh, the post optimality analysis that we have discussed so far. Okay.